On this Monday night, as mourners pay tribute to the Danforth victims, a push to turn grief into action. The Prime Minister in Toronto today to pay his respects, but he was pressed on whether he'll move forward with a handgun ban. Also tonight, a new strategy for Tim Hortons and the Canadian trying to restore confidence in the iconic brand. And 10 years after that terrible night on a Manitoba highway, Tim McLean's family and the son he never met struggle to heal. This is The National. A young woman and a little girl were laid to rest today, victims of a Toronto shooting that has shaken people in the city and well beyond. North of Toronto, a service was held for 10-year-old Juliana Kozis. In the city, police on horseback stood outside while hundreds gathered inside for the funeral of 18-year-old Reese Fallon, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau among the mourners. He also paid a visit to the Danforth, the scene of the deadly attack, a ceremonial moment that quickly turned political. The CBC's Greg Ross was there. Justin Trudeau placed flowers at this memorial for victims of the shooting on Toronto's Danforth Strip eight days ago. He honoured the two people killed. We need to work hard to honour their memories, honour their love uh, and, uh, and their spirit, and we will do that, all of us together. Most seemed happy to have the Prime Minister there, but not all. No, no, We're here to come together. Oh, We're here to... OK. This is not the time for it, sir. This heckler was removed by police, prompting this reaction from others in the crowd. But even some of Trudeau's biggest supporters had tough questions for him. They want to know how he's going to prevent shootings like this in the future. I applaud him for what he did, but I would applaud him further if, uh, if, he, if he took this uh, and used it as a springboard to to see if he can implement some very strict gun control laws. He needs yeah. to take action, yeah. you know, to do something about the guns. Blue Rodeo frontman Jim Cuddy lives in the neighbourhood and he echoed the call by Mayor John Tory for an all-out ban. I'm all for Tory's proposition. I said get, get rid of handguns. Uh, I, I don't, not sure why they need to be in the hands of individuals. I think it becomes so simple then somebody, I mean, I, I understand, I'm not blind to the fact that there'll be a lot of illegal guns, but they will be clearly illegal. Candid talk. Today on CBC Radio, the police chief was asked if he supports the ban. Anything that reduces uh, access to a firearm is, is a good thing. I, I would say from a uh, Toronto police perspective, my biggest issue are, are the people that are motivated to shoot. Toronto City Council recently voted to take the issue to the Trudeau government. When asked today if he'll move forward with a ban, the Prime Minister said this. We have to look at what the best way to fulfill our fundamental responsibilities as, as governments, as orders of government, to keep our citizens safe. Uh, people need to be safe. There's a, a lot of things that we're looking at right now. Obviously, there's a, a lot of strong emotions going on, uh, grieving, uh, looking at how we can continue to be stronger and more resilient as communities. Over time, this memorial will dwindle as normal life resumes. But for the people who live here and were touched by this tragedy, the issues of gun violence and public safety may not fade so quickly. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. A poll conducted in December suggests a vast majority of Canadians, 69%, favour an outright ban on guns in urban areas. Support was highest in Quebec, lowest in Alberta. Here's what else we're working on tonight on The National. The Canadian star brought in to write Tim Hortons. Peter Armstrong finds out what he has planned for the Brent. Plus, an Ottawa man loses his job after a video goes viral that seems to show him deliberately splashing people while driving a company van. But first, wildfires are burning in more than a dozen U.S. states tonight. In California, the fires are most destructive, deadly and out of control. Eight people have died. Tens of thousands are under evacuation orders. Firefighters are exhausted. In fact, it's shaping up to be the worst wildfire season they've seen in recorded history. The state has had to contend with more than 3,000 wildfires so far. That's more than we saw last year. And consider this. Of the 17 major wildfires burning right now as we speak, not a single one is contained. The biggest fire has also been the most destructive near Redding. More than 900 structures burned to the ground, making it the ninth most destructive wildfire in the state's history. And as Renee Filipponi tells us, the worst of it hasn't even arrived yet. 
That's oh, the fireplace. That's the fireplace. All well, gone. Rubble and ash are all that's left of this Redding, California neighborhood. Yeah, we waited years to buy this place. Um, first home. So many homes here devoured by fire. Today, some residents were allowed back in to survey the damage. Our biggest fear our whole li life living here was that a fire would get into this canyon and, and uh, roar up the canyon and take our house out. And uh, so Thursday night, about 7 o'clock, our worst nightmare came true. The fire that tore through Redding late last week moved faster than anyone expected and created a rare vortex of fire. And that's literally fire behavior that we, we have not experienced or seen or witnessed in a generation here in Northern California. Crews fighting that fire were able to get it 20% contained today, but winds and high temperatures are forecast again. And officials are keeping most of the 38,000 evacuees out of their homes for another night. We don't want any, any uh, families having to come in and then for us having to displace them and get them to evacuate again in case that happens. South of Redding, two fires burning in Mendocino County doubled in size overnight. The entire town of Lakeport was emptied today as flames approached. Sheriff came and, you know, the woo, 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 coming down the street and they went door to door and they're like, you got to go. Marilyn Martin was quick to leave. She knows how fast the flames can move. It's horrible. My daughter lost her home in the Valley Fire almost three years ago. And so, you know, it's pretty traumatic. That trauma becoming all too common in California. Fire season usually kicks into high gear in August and September, and now it seems to last all year round. We call this the new normal in California, and we've seen larger and more destructive fires year over year, and unfortunately this year doesn't look to be any different. For now, thousands of firefighters are working around the clock to maintain the control lines on the fires, while communities worry about trying to survive in the new normal. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, it may be the new normal, but it's just as unpredictable as ever, in part because that car fire is burning so hot and it's become so huge, it's actually creating its own micro weather system. Now, for more on that, I'm joined by CBC meteorologist Ryan Snodden. Ryan. Well, Andrew, part of why this fire has gotten so bad so quickly is that California has been going through drought-like conditions. Everything is dry, so when a fire does spark, it has so much fuel to burn through. Now we're seeing two unusual things with this fire, pyrocumulus clouds or mushroom clouds and fire tornadoes. So first, those mushroom clouds caused by air rushing in, the intense heat, that moisture condensing and rising all very quickly. And it can be dangerous because these big clouds create their own weather. It's like a thunderstorm, lightning, localized winds, that makes the fire even more volatile and harder to predict than it was. And then there are these fire tornadoes or fire nados. When a fire is burning extremely hot, the surrounding air is cooler, it gets pulled in like a vacuum, forming these funnels. They're strong enough to rip roofs off of houses, trees out of the ground, and they can start new fires by stirring up ash and throwing embers far into the air. Fortunately, they only last typically a few minutes. Right, but I guess, I mean, a few minutes, they can really matter out there. So, so tell me, what do the next few days and the next few weeks look like for fire crews? Yeah, it doesn't look good. Unfortunately, more of the same. Firefighters aren't going to get any relief anytime soon. The National Weather Service warning of extreme heat, low humidity, and gusts up to 40 kilometers per hour. Okay, CBC meteorologist Ryan Snodden, thanks so much. Thank you. Now, the weather hasn't helped the fire situation here in Canada either. In Ontario alone, there are well over 100 active fires. This one, known as Perry Sound 33, is one of the most pressing. It's burning just south of Sudbury, inching closer to the Trans-Canada, and it's still out of control. At this point, the highway is still open, but the smoke could hamper visibility. And as for the cause, not clear yet, but lightning has been a problem in those parts. 
So we will be watching those fires closely tonight. But Ian, you've got the latest on the fight between Tim Hortons and its parent company. That's right, Andrew. It's been a rough time for the company. Some franchise holders and customers are upset. But a new chief executive at Restaurant Brands International is hoping to turn things around. In a broadcast exclusive, Duncan Fulton tells the CBC about the plan and what it means for a huge Tim Hortons expansion into China. We'll play you some of that interview in a moment, but first let's look at what's gone wrong with Tim's. RBI was created in 2014 when a Brazilian investment giant merged Tim Hortons with Burger King. Those critical of management say Tim's Canadian corporate culture was replaced by a new obsession with efficiency and cutting costs. Layoffs followed and morale plummeted. But for franchisees, the big issue is the lack of support from RBI. They complained of being ordered to spend their own money on everything from renovations to unreliable supply chains. But RBI is hoping to change that relationship by bringing in Canadian Duncan Fulton, who used to work with other iconic brands, Canadian Tire and Sportcheck. He spoke to Peter Armstrong about the new strategy. I think the number one priority that's been established by the executive team has been the relationship with the restaurant owners. Right. So if you look at how the business operates every day, you have more than 1,500 Canadians and new Canadians who own and operate restaurants like this. Tim's is the epitome of a Canadian brand. So being able to take a bit more of Canada into another country, being able to design a restaurant that has some Canadian elements in it, taking the maple leaf abroad, taking the quality of our coffee abroad that's gonna stand up to any coffee of any competitor anywhere in the world, it's a great opportunity for the brand all around the world. Uh, do you believe though that at the end of the day, other people will want to come in, sit down and drink Tim Hortons coffee in a restaurant like this, or will the, the user experience, the customer experience, have to fundamentally change to become something distinctly Chinese to, for it to be a success? I think the customer experience has to change in the local market. We work with master franchisees in different markets that are experts in the market that say, listen, this has to stay. This has to change. It has to be tailored for a local flavor. It has to be tailored for uh, local uh, guest experiences. So, I mean, there's a brand standard that you want to maintain, but you want to be flexible. Right. And if you're in a market that wants, you know, a churro instead of a donut, then do a churro. And that, that happens today in Spain. So, Peter, lots to talk about there. Let's start with, with this push into China. It's enormous. I mean, this is one of the biggest pushes we've seen from any Canadian company in any industry into a foreign market like that. 1,500 stores over 10 years. It is an enormous growth potential. It, it comes with no small amount of risk, too. We saw they didn't grow particularly well in the United States. But if they can pull this off, enormous growth potential for Tim Hortons, for RBI, too. And it sounds like something he said there about China may be relevant for Canada, and that is allowing the individual franchisees to kind of use their expertise and right. their local knowledge. I, it, absolutely. I, I mean, in every response he had, he was really messaging through that, I think, to the domestic franchisees to say, we understand your value. We know why you're important. We know you have the expertise and that we as the parent company need to be more flexible was the word he used at the end of that clip. And that's a message that he needs to give because he needs to fix that relationship. This is costing everybody, not just the store owners. RBI is making all kinds of profits, but they should be making yet more. I mean, you look at RBI's structure, they own what? Like, 18,000 Burger Kings and 4,500 Tim Hortons, and Tim Hortons franchises bring in half the earnings for that company. So at a very small fraction of the number of total stores, they're still bringing in all kinds of money. So it's important for them to get that relationship fixed, get it right, and find a path that they can sort of do something to move forward. For example, perhaps this idea that they're going to launch a, a kid's menu in these stores. It's, it's something they can do with the franchisees together that would be a positive experience. It wouldn't be fighting over the bills for the, the paper and the towels that they use. It would be something positive. They can try to, to find one positive thing, one element they can use as a stepping stone towards fixing everything else. Just a few seconds left, but every Tim Hortons I walk by, every single one has a lineup, but I, they obviously can't take their success for granted. They can't, and, and retail is littered with the ghosts of, of franchises that have taken that for granted. You know, I talked to one, one retail analyst who said, look, this is a great plan. It would be great to see if Tim Hortons can pull this off. Sears had a plan too, and look where it is now. Thanks, Peter. You bet.
One last note on all of this. Despite its recent struggles, Tim Hortons is still doing very well, as Peter pointed out. Here in Canada, it is way out ahead of its chief competitor, McDonald's. Tim's brought in almost $9 billion in gross sales last year. McDonald's was in second. It earned about $5 billion. Starbucks in third place, grossing just under $2 billion. And lots of other stories developing at this hour, including news that suspended Toronto Blue Jays pitcher Roberto Osuna has been traded. That'll do it. Osuna strikes out the ball. He retires the side. In a statement this evening, the Jays confirmed they've traded Osuna to the Houston Astros. They'll get three pitchers in return. Osuna was arrested and charged last May with assault. He was given a 75-game suspension and will be eligible to return next Sunday. In a statement, the Astros said they believe he's remorseful and that he'll comply with their zero-tolerance policy for abuse. CBS has decided against taking any swift action against its chief executive, Les Moonves. It was an open question what would happen to him after the New Yorker published a story detailing sexual misconduct allegations by six women. But after meeting today, CBS's board of directors said it's now looking for outside counsel to conduct an independent investigation. Moonves, meanwhile, admitted he may have at times made women feel uncomfortable, but insists he always understood that no means no. In Ottawa tonight, a van driver is out of a job after getting a lot of people very angry and a handful of people very wet. The driver of this van was caught on camera repeatedly veering into these massive puddles, soaking pedestrians on a rainy day. Now, we don't know if he was uh, having a bad day or just being a jerk, but since this video was uploaded on Friday, angry comments flooded the company's Facebook page, and now the company has apologized and fired the driver. You know, this raises a lot of issues, Andrew. The first one is, without that video, this story would have gone nowhere. And interesting, by the way, that someone has such high-quality video shooting out of the back of their vehicle. But could you imagine if someone had just complained that someone was deliberately trying to splash me and they didn't have proof of that? I, I think it would have been a non-story. Yeah, no kidding. And, and it's important to note exactly what that video captures, right? I mean, the first thing is, is the thing that I suppose ticks a lot of people off, the splashing of people, but also presumably something that a lot of people raised in their angry comments online, that this appears to be a safety issue too, right? If the van is indeed veering in and out, uh, you know, within its lane, but, but in pretty wet weather. And that seems to be what the company has really picked up on in its apology, uh, expressly saying that safety is its number one priority in making its decision. And it insists this is an isolated incident. And uh, if you've ever thought of veering into that puddle because you see a pedestrian coming, you <laughs> never know what video camera might be uh, catching you. Yep. Still ahead on The National, Barack Obama and Joe Biden spark a frenzy at a small DC coffee shop. Their meme-worthy friendship is our moment of the day. Three quarters of Zimbabweans voted today in the first election since the end of Robert Mugabe's rule. We're going to take you there. Plus a grim anniversary for witnesses, families, and friends of a brutal murder. Today marks a decade since Tim McLean was killed on board a Greyhound bus. And tonight we look at the legacy of that tragic night. He was just vibrant energy. And I so miss that in my world. He always lived his life the way he wanted to. We're trying to move on, but it's very hard. And I don't think, I don't think we'll ever be over it. Less than a year after Robert Mugabe's brutal regime came crashing down, millions of Zimbabweans cast votes in historic elections today with the ink on their fingers to prove it. For so many, this was like living a dream almost four decades in the making. And it's easy to see why people in the country are so optimistic. It is, after all, still emerging from a long, difficult chapter in its history. Here's a brief look at why there is so much hope for the future. Mugabe often said war was the only path to peace. Robert Mugabe was hailed as a revolutionary hero when he came to power in 1980, a proud African nationalist who unilaterally declared independence from a fading British empire. But the dream of democracy fizzled as Mugabe consolidated his power, often brutally, through suspected murder and torture. 
and he unleashed financial chaos. With vast mineral resources and rich farmland, Zimbabwe should be one of the wealthiest countries in Africa. But mismanagement and corruption, along with Western sanctions, crushed the economy. At one point, 10 years ago, inflation was so bad, the government issued a $100 trillion banknote. Every day, Zimbabweans can be seen lining up here. They're mostly young and unemployed. And yet Mugabe lived in luxury as his hold on power seemed absolute. Until finally last fall, when he was overthrown by his former right-hand man, Emerson Mangagwa, who promised a bright democratic future despite his own dark past. The celebrations were immediate. And this was also a day of celebration for many as people marked ballots without Mugabe's name on them. It will likely take several days to get the full results. CBC's Thomas Dagala now with who's in the race and what's at stake. As the sun came up, they showed up and kept coming all day. I'm declaring this polling station open. Voters eager for a new future in a land with such a troubled past. I would like people to go to school, more schools, more clinics, more jobs for everyone. I'm very hopeful for New Zimbabwe. Arriving by helicopter, President Emerson Mnangagwa, showing off the power of the office he holds and keen to add legitimacy to the win he expects. The campaigning was peaceful. The voting today is peaceful. A duly elected President Menangagwa says he would open up Zimbabwe to much needed foreign investment, a way to repair the shattered economy. But the man he pushed out still looms large, longtime leader Robert Mugabe. His sheer presence, a reminder of his brutal legacy and how Menangagwa saw it through as Mugabe's right hand man. It's, it's been both an asset and a liability for him because he can say, you know, I've got experience. Some of the younger voters will probably be saying, look, we want a, a, a whole new um, system. Many of those young voters see their future in this man, 40-year-old Nelson Chamisa, a self-styled reformer greeted like a rock star at the polling station. Chamisa draws inspiration from the likes of Barack Obama and Justin Trudeau. If the ballot is an appropriate one, a genuine one, and not a bastardized or a fake one, victory is certain for the people. International election observers were allowed in for the first time in 16 years, watching for violence and interference. They reported very few problems, and that was once unthinkable in Zimbabwe. The difference is between night and day. 2002 was completely different. There was a an atmosphere of fear and intimidation. This election's off to a promising start, but the real test will be whether the final results set off a revolt. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, London. I still ahead on The National. Donald Trump threatens a government shutdown over funding for his wall, and we revisit Paul Hunter's documentary, The Places, The Plans, and The People on both sides of the debate. They have um, the American dream, and I don't think a wall will be enough to stop them from searching for a better life. They could be a drug dealer, they could be a kidnapper, they could be anything. I mean, it's just stupid not to know who's coming across your borders. It's stupid. You're a stupid country if you let that happen. Welcome back. Tonight on The National, the woman charged with first-degree murder in the stabbing death of another woman at a Toronto shopper's drug mart has been found fit to stand trial. Rohini Bissasar was previously declared unfit due to a mental disorder, but according to the Ontario Review Board, her mental state has improved enough to proceed. Police have said the attack was unprovoked. Also tonight, the man accused of shooting five people to death last month at a Maryland newspaper office has pleaded not guilty. Jared Ramos faces 23 charges for allegedly opening fire inside the Capitol Gazette newsroom on June 28th. He remains in jail without bail. In France, video has gone viral of a woman being slapped by a man she says was sexually harassing her. 
The woman says she was walking home in Paris when a man made degrading comments. She says they argued and then he walked over and slapped her. The whole episode is bolstering a move by the French government to crack down on sexual harassment in public places. It plans to hand out fines to offenders. President Trump is threatening to grind the entire U.S. government to a halt if he doesn't get what he wants on immigration. If we don't get border security, after many, many years of talk within the United States, I would have no problem doing a shutdown. It's time we had proper border security. We're the laughing stock of the world. We have the worst immigration laws anywhere in the world. Trump's message to Congress was blunt, pay for the border wall or he'll shut the place down, as he said. The threat comes two months before the U.S. budget deadline. Congress will have to approve $1.6 billion to even start construction. Without it, Trump's divisive wall is mostly made of high hopes. This winter, we asked Paul Hunter to show us what really goes on at the border. For anyone who doubts Donald Trump when he talks about guarding against illegal immigrants who sneak into the U.S. from Mexico every single day, Four, five, 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 eight, four, five, consider the Rio Grande River Bank here in the small town of Roma, Texas. There's spread out. Somewhere down there, in the thick of all this, U.S. Border Patrol agents have just spotted something. Right where I'm at, I'm talking to you, it's a cavern. Someone, maybe more, hiding deep in the reeds at River's Edge. Would you step back, please? Yes, hey. Soon enough, they're captured and handcuffed. Two men who just dared cross into America. The 11th and 12th illegal migrants found right here on this day by lunchtime. A place where there's no wall, no fence, just that river separating the U.S. from Mexico. At least... That's all there is for now. If Donald Trump has his way, one of these will be the kind of thing that'll soon change that border forever. Outside San Diego, they are the freshly minted prototypes for his long promised border wall. Catching the eye already of border patrol agents kicking the tires, checking them out each with pros and cons, slight variations, but a key theme. All of them are imposing. All of them are meant to be high enough and tough enough to stop illegal border crossings into America. The winning design, still TBA. A few steps south of those prototypes, there is a wall in this part of Southern California. It's been in place for years. It's ramshackle, and repairs where migrants have cut their way through it are everywhere. 20 minutes to the west. And part of it even runs into the Pacific. And even on this day, here, it doesn't do its job. These three, now held by Border Patrol, told us they'd fled Gambia in April and had just now squeezed through the old fence right where the water meets the beach. Trump's wall, when and if it's ever built, is meant to stop all of it. But at what price? Back in Texas, a state rich in cross-border culture with its fast-growing Hispanic population, El Paso typifies the mounting opposition to Trump's wall. So who is that? That's, that's Border Patrol. That, that is the, uh, one of their helicopters. Uh, 
because we're standing here near the border, they come out to check well, us out? Well, they, they do that, yes, because of that, and also they do that uh, in a regular way. Human rights activist Fernando Garcia took us just outside the city where there's been a wall for a decade and where Trump's plans to make it bigger and more imposing are met with resentment on both sides. That when Trump leaves, uh, they're going to tear down this wall Buenos and they're just going to put a fence so people will be able to come across. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. For millions of Hispanic Americans, Trump's bigger, stronger wall is little more than a big, ugly symbol. We're talking about hate and uh, we're talking about, about issues of race and we're talking about xenophobia. That's what is the essence of this wall. Do you believe Latinos will rise up? and register and vote and and change the future of Texas because of this wall and because of immigration policy? I don't have any doubt that Latinos are going to be more active politically. And I do believe that there's going to be a major backlash, a political backlash. And though Trump talks about a wall, fact is that old fence stretches along a fair chunk of the border already even if, in parts, it can seem absurd. In some places, it just stops. Elsewhere, being often not quite on the actual border, it cuts through farmland, so they've left gaps to allow American farmers free passage within their own country. In yet other places, geography makes a wall seem needless, let alone problematic, not to mention unsightly. Imagine a giant wall nine meters high cutting through this vista. So when we look out there, I see those hills, that's Mexico. That's right? Mexico, actually it's Mexico 40 yards away from here. We've hiked through all this for an hour and a half, and, and here we are. Where is here? Where are we? This is the Rio Grande, and that's Mexico. That's Mexico right there? Right there, 20 feet away. Bill Addington's family has ranched here for generations. Trump's yeah, wall would man, cut man, through his land, line. block access to the river, slash the value of his property, and rip him apart. It really does break my heart that, it's, that Americans have come so far as to, to be so much in fear and some in, some of them in hate against people that have been our neighbors here for a long time. Add more border patrol agents, he says, drones even, but not a wall. No way, no how. Building a wall over this against the will of the people that live here, such as me, will come over my dead body, to be honest. Remember the town of Roma, where those migrants were caught in the bushes along the riverbank? Even here, there's opposition for Trump's wall. Here, abandoned life jackets, discarded clothing, and medicine left in the fanny pack for those who cross highlight migrants are a daily reality. But, say those who live here. They don't have weapons. They're, they don't come here trying to damage us. They have um, the American dream, and I don't think a wall will be enough to stop them from searching for a better life. They're not really bad people. They're just trying to make a living, you know? I mean, like, I just think that he should at least let them give him a chance for that. You know, like, I honestly think that it's, it's not really fair. Just up the river, the existing wall has left a kind of no man's land. This field is north of the border, but south of the fence. And it splits a Texas golf course from the rest of the state, where for all the naysayers we met, we found some who say to Trump one year later, legal immigrants are fine. Illegals build that wall. You don't know who they are. They could be a murderer, they could be a drug dealer, they could be a kidnapper, they could be anything. 
I mean, it's just stupid not to know who's coming across your borders. It's stupid. You're a stupid country if you let that happen. Short answer on all of it, it's complicated. Go to the eastern edge of the border. This is Brownsville, Texas, some 3,000 kilometers from those prototypes in San Diego, and you can practically walk across the divide. But here, everyone just kind of lives, as Mexicans and Americans always have along the border. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Brownsville, Texas. Now, artists and activists couldn't resist turning those walls into their canvas. They used lights to project graffiti that mocks the whole idea of keeping people out. It's a crafty way to make a point, but it's actually out of step with global trends. In 1989, there were only 16 border fences, according to research out of Quebec. Now, 70 borders have walls completed or under construction. The building boom has been spurred on by 9-11, the Arab Spring, and the European migrant crisis. Paul's documentary has been watched and shared millions of times on our YouTube page. You can find it and share it right there at CBC The National. Still ahead on the program, our moment of the day. Hold on, hold on. What did you get here? I got one of these, uh, whatever the hell it calls. Barack Obama and Joe Biden out showing off their bromance today. The political duo's highly documented friendship made waves during their eight years in office. There were the photos that inspired so many gifts and, of course, uh, a moment when Obama surprised Biden by presenting him the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And now, they're back together. But first, Canadian hockey great Drew McGinley has made it official. He is retiring from the NHL, making the announcement in Calgary, where he played 16 of his 20 seasons in the league. And I remember starting hockey at age seven and going to my first tryout and dreaming of how great it would be. And it's been even better. These, these 20 years in the NHL, it's been better. And um, I'm excited for retirement and to be with my family, but... Um, I'm going to miss, miss all of you and all of this. Aginla was one of the greatest scorers of his generation with 625 goals and 675 assists. He played more than 1,200 games with the Flames before being traded to Pittsburgh in 2013. But one of his greatest moments came with Team Canada, passing the puck to Sidney Crosby for the golden goal at the 2010 Olympics. Flames teammate Craig Conroy praised Aginla as a powerhouse. As nice as he is off the ice, he was a, a true competitor on the ice. And whatever, if it was, we needed a fight, if we needed a big hit, if we needed a big goal, I mean, he was there to do it. And for about three or four years, I don't think there was a better player in the NHL. Again, Le says his immediate future will be spent being a full-time husband and father, but he's not ruling out a possible future role in NHL management. Part of the Trans-Canada Highway is closed off after a major incident on a Greyhound bus. Unconfirmed reports claim a person was stabbed and may have been decapitated. That terrible detail has marked the killing of Timothy McLean from the moment the news broke 10 years ago. At the age of 22, McLean was a carnival barker, returning to Winnipeg after doing some work in Alberta. Vince Lee was traveling from Edmonton to a job interview in Winnipeg. All of a sudden, we all heard this scream, a blood-curdling scream. According to witnesses, he calmly, methodically began to stab McLean with a knife. A big freaking Rambo knife, a uh, hunting knife, and it was covered in blood, and he was, he just kept going at the guy. It was like it was a robot. But a judge found Lee was not criminally responsible for killing McLean due to mental illness. One decade after the attack, it's clear many lives were torn apart in the aftermath. One of the first police officers on the scene took his own life after years of struggle. And three generations of McLean's family are still grappling with what happened. Karen Pauls brings us their story. This is where Greyhound Bus 1170 came to a sudden stop 10 years ago. A man then known as Vince Lee was attacking his seatmate, Timothy McLean. 
stabbing, decapitating, cannibalizing. It took five hours for police to arrest him. This woman was on the bus. She still can't get the sound of screaming out of her head. I thought it was just one of those scary movies. <laughs> we can't identify her or her daughter under child welfare laws. Two and a half years ago, <laughs> social workers apprehended her baby. They said her PTSD made her an unfit mother. I'm constantly waking up depressed and not getting the proper help. Cook your food. The little girl lived in a foster home until a year ago when the court granted her grandmother guardianship and gave her mother access. She is a phenomenal joy. She's, she mesmerizes everybody that comes in contact with her by her little voice and everything. She just, she's loved by everybody. Carol Dedelli says her son's death left a big hole in her life, but now she also sees some hope. And it took a long time to really want to get up every day. And I was given a few reasons to feel that way, to want to get up. One of those reasons, a grandson. Five months after Timothy McLean's death, his son was born. I was in shock and then scared and then excited and then really worried. The mother was young, struggling to care for two other children by a different father. In 2016, a judge gave Dedelli permanent guardianship. He is a gift, a gift from God sent by my son to give me a reason to get up every day and to take care of. And um, I'm doing that to the best of my ability. She's still concerned about the family dynamics, so for now, doesn't want the boy's mother or her ex-husband visiting him unsupervised. I'm okay looking through these. It's sad that we don't have any recent pictures of him. But for now, these will have to do. It means these pictures are all Tim McLean Sr. has of his son and his grandson. Like his father, that's what we're left with, his memories. Still struggling to cope with the loss, he visits his son's gravesite every week. I sit and I talk with him. Talk I tell him everything. I just joke around about my day and how much we miss him and how sad it makes me. Shortly after the attack, McLean Sr. launched a lawsuit against Greyhound. Ten years later, it's at an impasse. We don't believe the settlement that they offered for our grandson is at all reasonable. But for today, both parents want the focus to be on their son. He was just vibrant energy, and I so miss that in my world. He always lived his life the way he wanted to. We're trying to move on, but it's very hard. And I don't think, I don't think we'll ever be over it. What's clear in the decades since the attack is that Timothy McLean wasn't the only victim. Many lives were torn apart. Karen Pauls, CBC News, near Portage La Prairie, Manitoba. Vince Lee has also lived a decade under the shadow of his own violent acts. Barely seven months after he killed Timothy McLean, a judge ruled that he was not criminally responsible. The correct conclusion was reached. Mr. <laughs> Lee is a schizophrenic. Mr. Lee had a severe mental disease. He still did it. Whether he was in his right frame of mind or not, he still did the act. Somebody, there was nobody else on that bus holding a knife. Lee remained in a mental facility in Selkirk, but in 2012, he was allowed to go out if accompanied. By 2014, that was no longer required, and by 2015, he could visit Winnipeg, and he applied to live in a group home. Last year, he was granted an absolute discharge by the Manitoba Criminal Code Review Board. He no longer requires supervision and has changed his name.
And a reminder, The National Today takes you inside our journalism every afternoon. That's our newsletter, going deeper on the top stories and highlighting some stories you might have missed. Today, more questions than answers from the final report into the disappearance of Malaysia Airlines Flight 370. The investigation suggests the plane was deliberately steered off course, but no explanation as to why or by who. Subscribe to our newsletter at cbcnews.ca slash the national. Well, it was a reunion that quickly grabbed the public's attention at a bakery in Washington. Former President Barack Obama and former Vice President Joe Biden were spotted back together again today, proving that their bromance is still alive and well. So we asked people what it was like to see them in action, out of office. That is our moment of the day. But then I look up as I, I'm fixing my coffee and, and I see Obama is like looking at me. In the corner of my eye, I see Barack talking to Joe Biden feet from me. And it was this moment of I couldn't even speak anymore and I just started shaking. It was like the most exciting celebrity encounter that I've ever had in my life. Hold on, hold on. What did you get here? I got one of these, uh, whatever the hell it's called. It's, uh, whatever the hell it's called. Damn. It's not doesn't sign. Uh, yeah, that looks pretty good, that cat. Yeah. I think I gotta have one of those. Yeah, you lost one of those, too. Yes, sir. So, like, I'm, like, really trying to surreptitiously pull out my phone, but also not look suspicious that I'm reaching for something, and and so as I walk by, I just uh, make a goofy face and, and take a picture real quick. As he was making his way to the car, I kind of reached out to shake a couple more people's hands. And I was like, I'm not going to miss my opportunity. So just reached in and, yeah, shook his hand. It was just nice to see that, that these two men, they, they genuinely appear to care about each other. Like, the last thing they said to one another was Obama pointed over to Joe and said, Hey, Joe, are you in this car with me? As he was walking to the SUV. Hey, Joe, are you supposed to be in this car with me? I don't think lunch tomorrow or the rest of my life will compare. You know, it's like a scene out of that Netflix uh, series, Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee, right? It just <laughs> seems like two big names hanging out. But apparently there were at least, what, uh, eight sec Secret Service agents there, and ex-presidents get a lot of security. So I think there was a lot of uh, choreography going on behind the right. kind of charming scenes. And sure enough, that's not just any bakery. So it's actually called the Dog Tag Bakery. And according to their website, this is a place that helps train and employ disabled veterans. And Obama and Biden both said, hey, we really enjoy the fact that uh, you guys do what you do and, and good work. That is The National for this Monday, July 30th. Thanks so much for joining us. Good night. Good night.